Welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture here on BC 308. We're going through Daniel, and we have been looking at Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Just four verses, but very, very um, amazing, amazing prophecy um, given about um, these 490 years which the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Daniel about. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the New Testament. So, you know, our study in Daniel will continue, but what we want to do is we want to cross-reference how the New Testament throws more light and understanding on these verses, right? So we go first to Matthew 24, where the Lord Jesus himself refers to this, uh, Daniel's prophecy, this particular aspect of Daniel's prophecy. We will just uh, uh, look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 and 16. Daniel 24, 15 and 16, please. Therefore, when you see abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy city, who even reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Amen. Mm. Yeah. So now, very interesting. The disciples are asking Jesus, you know, what will be the signs of the end times? And so Jesus is going through. He prophesied. He says, you know, at, at, this is in Matthew 24, verse 2. He said, the temple will be destroyed. Now you see this temple, not one stone will be left. Everything will be thrown down. So that was the temple being destroyed. But in verse 15, he is now referring to the prophecy of Daniel, Daniel 20, Matthew 24, 15. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that means this man, he is referring to him as the man, the abomination, abomination meaning he is an abomination before God. He speaks all these blasphemies, blasphemous things against God. He's the one who's going to make desolate. So he's, Jesus refers to this man as the abomination of desolation. When you see this abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Very interesting. Why is it interesting? Because in verse 2, verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 24, Jesus said, this temple will be destroyed. It actually happened. That was fulfilling Daniel 9 and verse 26. The the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. Jesus repeated that in Matthew 24, 1 and 2. This temple will be destroyed, which happened. If the temple is destroyed, there is no holy place. But in verse 15, he says, this abomination of desolation will be standing in the holy place. Today, uh, there is no holy place. The temple has been destroyed. Nothing. It hasn't been rebuilt. There is no holy place that on the Temple Mount, there is the mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Which means, even Jesus is recognizing that there has to be a literal temple. Now, when you listen to or when you read some books about the end times, some people say, no, there is uh, a literal temple will not happen. Uh, it won't be there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, talk it's not talking about a literal temple. But by reading the text, which we saw in Matthew 9, and now we're looking in, um, sorry, Matthew 24, 15, Daniel 9, Jesus is saying, this man is going to stand in the holy place. There has to be a holy place where he's going to stand. Which Daniel wrote about, that this man is going to stop the daily sacrifices. He will uh, desecrate the sanctuary. So we can stay with confidence that based on the text of scripture, and we will see again, Second Thessalonians 2 and also in Revelation, that there has to be this third temple. Because it is in this temple 
that he is going to desecrate. He's going to stand in the holy place, this abomination of desolation. Okay. And this is going to happen when, if you, um, in Matthew 24, and you also look at verse 21, I'm just skipping a few verses in between, but verse 21, Jesus is saying, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. So verse 21. That means when this man, this abomination of desolation is standing in the temple, in the holy place, that's a sign. It's going to be this great tribulation. So this is the second half of the three and a half years. So the seven years, we refer to it, Daniel 73 could refer to it as the year, seven years of tribulation. The second half of the tribulation is the great tribulation because it is going to be very bad, that three and a half years. He'll, he'll make a covenant for one week, that is seven years. So he'll start off in a very peaceful way. But in the middle of that covenant, in the middle of the week, he's going to break the covenant. He's going to stop the daily sacrifices. He will stand himself. He will stand in the holy place. And then there's going to be great tribulation. Okay. Let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll look at some more. The more we look at these scriptures, more understanding we get of Daniel chapter 9. So let's go to Second Thessalonians. And we're going to read chapter 2. And verses... One to nine. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to nine. Now the apostle Paul is referring to Daniel's prophecy and he's telling us more things. Daniel chapter two, oh, sorry, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one to nine. Somebody can read that, please. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, although the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God, that is called God and all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he, is, that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the, work, the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, now the Apostle Paul is referring to what Daniel said. So, and Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, and he's saying, Thessalonians, remember, I explained all these things to you, which means that the Apostle Paul must have explained, and I'm, I'm thinking, he must have explained Daniel to you know these new believers, to these believers in Thessalonica. So I, I'm thinking, because he's saying, remember, I told you all these things, and now he's writing what he has told them. So he says, you know, I, 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 I don't want you to think that you know the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus has already come and we missed our gathering together, we missed the rapture. Say no, no, no. So the context here, verse one, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one is of a gathering together to Him. That is the rapture of the church. That is the background is also very beautifully described in First Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, how we will caught up 
you know, we'll receive glorified bodies and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So that's what he's referring to. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him. So the Lord is coming. We're going to be gathered together to him, which he has described very clearly how it's going to happen. He says, I don't want you to think that, you know, verse 2, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 2, I don't want you to think as though the day of Christ has already come. That, that gathering together, the day of Christ has already happened. No, 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 don't. Don't worry. Don't, don't think you missed it. Right? Because he says, verse 3, that day will not come. There's got to be some things that they, there's a falling away of sin happening. So this, this, this people are going, there's going to be people who will wander away from the faith. The love of many will grow cold. There will be people who will depart from the faith. And Paul wrote about it in First Thessalonians, First Timothy chapter 4. They'll, some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines. And so that is going to be a part of what's happening. It's very much like what Jesus said, you know, in, in Matthew 24. Many will come in my name, saying I'm the Christ, and they'll deceive many. So there's going to be this great deception. Then, after that big deception, there's going to be the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself. This is verse 4. And uh, all that is called God, or this worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, I want to highlight some things here. Paul is referring to what Daniel spoke about. The one who makes desolate. The, the one who moves on the wings of abomination, making desolate. Jesus used the term, the abomination of desolation. Paul is using many different terms. He's referring to him as uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and later on, he refers to him as the lawless one. So Paul is using different terms, but he's referring to the same person that Daniel has been writing about. And also you see in verse 4 that this man, he exalts himself above all that is called God. That's exactly what Daniel said. You know, Daniel said in chapter 7, chapter 8, that this man is speaking blasphemous things against God. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's exalting himself above all that is called God. And then he says he sits as God in the temple of God. Now think about that one more time. He sits in the temple of God. So that's why they're saying there has to be a temple. Jesus said he will stand in the most holy place. He will stand in the holy place. Here Paul is saying he will sit in the temple of God. Right? So once again, and we will see this again in Revelation, there has to be a third temple. Now, what we do know is that the Jewish people, people in Israel, they are all ready to build a temple. They've got everything they need to erect a temple. They can do it very fast, maybe in three months or some, I don't know how fast they'll work. They'll work very fast. And uh, they are, uh, you know, I was just reading in the news, from India, 10,000 people are going to go to Israel to work uh, in construction work. I'm, I'm just thinking, they're, they, they don't have enough people to do construction work. They are bringing in laborers from other parts of the world. I was just reading the news. Today, 10,000 people from India are going to go to Israel to do construction work. I'm thinking, like, what, what are they? They're going to do work. That means that they're, they're getting labor people to come and they're getting ready. I, 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 you know, whether whether these people are going to be doing some construction of the temple, I don't know, but they, they have everything ready. Everything's ready. So this temple will be rebuilt because this man of sin has to sit in the temple of God, saying he is God and demanding worship. 
So Paul is telling, you know, this is going to happen. What Daniel spoke about, it's going to literally happen. Right? So verse 5, he says, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? Then verse 6. But then he says, but before this man of sin can be revealed, something has to happen. He says, verse 6, and now you know what is restraining. There is something that is holding back this man of sin, this abomination of desolation, this antichrist from being revealed. There's something holding him back, something holding back. So that he may be revealed in his own time. So there is a time and he's going to be revealed. So, but there's something restraining, something holding back. Verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. I mean, this, the, the, the lawlessness and this, this unseen evil is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume. So here's how it's going to happen. So the context, the day of Christ, the coming of the Lord, our gathering together unto him, verse 1. Very close to that happening, the lawless one has to come. The man of sin, the son of perdition. But there's only one thing that's holding him back. And when that which is restraining him is taken out of the way, then this lawless one will be revealed. And eventually he's going to sit in the temple of God. So question, what is it that's restraining him, which needs to be taken out of the way? Now, in verse 6, uh, sorry, verse 7, verse 7, two times the personal, uh, the, the pronoun he is used. In verse 7, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the question is, who is he? Because he has to be taken out of the way, then the lawless one will be revealed. So there has been a lot of debate, and I think we, we, we also studied this in our second year course on the end times, where we discussed this. We said, you know, there can only be two possibilities, the he could refer to the Holy Spirit or the he could refer to the church. Now, we know that in the New Testament, there are different pictures of the church. The church is the bride of Christ, which is feminine. But the church is the body of Christ, which is masculine. The church is an army. The church is a family. It's the house of God. Uh, the church is a pillar, uh, the church is, so there are many different pictures of the church. But in our minds, we are mostly thinking about the church as the bride of Christ. We're always thinking that. But we also should understand the church is the body of Christ, which is masculine. So, we have a choice to make. The he, does it refer to the Holy Spirit or does it refer to the church? Now what we do know is this, that the Holy Spirit is operating on the earth during the seven years of tribulation. How do we know that? Well, we can give several points. First, there are going to be 144,000 Jews who will be anointed by God to serve God during the tribulation. We will see this in Revelation chapter 7. So if there are 144,000 Jewish witnesses, ministers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is still operating. Second, there are many believe, people who will believe during the tribulation. They will be saved. And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ with them. And many of them will be martyred. That phrase, testimony of Jesus, refers to the spirit of prophecy, refers to the Holy Spirit. So for people to be saved during the tribulation, you cannot be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the testimony of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. 
So we see again another evidence that the Holy Spirit is, is, is bringing salvation to people during the tribulation because people will repent and they will say, we be saved. And they will have the testimony of Jesus. Third, during this second half of the tribulation, there will be two witnesses, Elijah and another prophet, two witnesses. For the, for the second half of the tribulation, they will be doing signs, wonders and miracles. They will be prophesying. They'll be doing witnesses, two witnesses whom God will send. Do you see this in Revelation chapter 11? Now, for them to be doing that, they need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So again, the Holy Spirit is at work during the tribulation. So we can see here that, and, and then another reference is Zechariah 12 verse 10, where God says, I will pour out my spirit of grace and supplication on the house of David. So in the last days, there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There will be a special outpouring on the house of David. Zechariah 12.10. He will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication on the house of David. And they will see the one whom they have pierced. And they will mourn. That means that will go on until they see Jesus who comes. And uh, the one whom they pierce. So there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, especially on the house of Israel, the house of David, in the last days. So very obvious, the Holy Spirit is at work. So we can't say the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way and he won't be around here during the seven years of tribulation. No, he's going to be very much here doing all of these things. So our only option is this refers to the church, which matches very nicely with verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him, the church is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one is revealed. So what is restraining the Antichrist, the lawless one, from being revealed? Second Thessalonians 2 verse 7. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That is the church, the body of Christ. When we are taken out of the way, then the lawless one will be revealed. This man of sin, the son of perdition, who sets himself up as God in the temple of God, demanding to be worshipped. And he will come with uh, lying signs and wonders. He will come with that. Okay. So that Second Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, is, uh, is, is, is it brings in a lot of insight. It tells us that. There will be a temple, Antichrist will be seated there, but for the Son of Man to be revealed, the church has to be taken out of the way. Now, there is a common question, which is, when will the temple be rebuilt? Before the rapture or after the rapture? Uh, we are not very sure. Uh, in answer. Uh, what we know is, right now, people, the Jewish people, the especially the uh, smaller group, the kind of the very uh, orthodox Jews, they are all ready, they've got everything ready to rebuild the temple. So they are ready. We don't know exactly whether the, the rebuilding of the temple will take place before the rapture or right after the rapture. Now, if you go by the sequence of events, if the man of sin, the son of perdition is being revealed after the rapture, after the church is taken out of the way, He's going to set up a covenant of peace for seven years. And my guess, I'm just saying it's a guess because we can't prove it with chapter and verse. My guess is that as part of the covenant of peace, he will somehow be able to get the Jewish people to build the temple. They will do it in three months. They'll put up the temple. So my guess or my thought is that as soon as the rapture takes place, this man of sin is revealed. He comes as a man of peace first. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 says he comes riding on a white horse. He comes as a man of peace. So it's highly likely at the beginning of his seven-year period, he's going to convince people that it's okay to have the temple. 
the temple will be rebuilt. But it is in this temple, in the middle of the seven years, he will break everything and he will put himself up as God. Okay. Any questions on this before we jump into cross-referencing from Revelation as well? Any questions? Uh, so Libya says, um, uh, some interpreting the Holy Spirit's, um, you know, uh, I have, uh, the restraining one as the Holy Spirit's influence on the church. Is that an accurate interpretation? So, um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't argue, I wouldn't fight with people uh, about, uh, you know, what is right exactly, what's right. You know, my, my thing is, uh, as we just explained, if we say that the Holy Spirit is withdrawing his influence on the church, that means he's no longer active, he's no longer working. But we see in the book of Revelation that God's people, that people are being saved, people are bearing, bearing witness, and there are these two prophets empowered by the Holy Spirit, and so on. So it means the Holy Spirit is still active on the earth, but as the church is taken out of the way. So I would respond with that, saying, hey, I feel based on the understanding of scripture that it's a church that is taken out of the way, and the Holy Spirit is continuing his work through the tribulation. Right? So I'm not going to fight with them. Uh, I will just say that this is my, my understanding, and uh, you know, let people decide. All right, now let's jump into Revelation. The book of Revelation, again, adds to what Daniel has written. Right? So let's go to Revelation chapter 11, and uh, we will, and I, I'll just point, so we are going to come into the book of Revelation and read through it verse by verse and study it. But now I'm just going to point us to certain text in Revelation that connects to Daniel 9, okay? So we're not going to read everything, just pointing to those portions that connect to Daniel 9. Once we finish Daniel, I think, you know, within maybe next week, we can finish Daniel. We have chapters 11 and 12 to do. Um, we finish Daniel, then we are going to go through Revelation verse by verse. But now I just want to point to certain text in Revelation that is referencing Daniel 9. So let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And we will read verses 1, 2, and 3, please. Revelation 11, 1, 2, and 3. Somebody could read that. Revelation 11, 1, 2, 3. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Mm. Now, think about this. Look at it very carefully. There's the angel of God. And the angel is getting an instruction. Measure the temple of God. But don't measure, uh, measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship. But leave out the court. So, first of all, there has to be a temple right, to measure. Now, some people say, oh, this is not a literal temple. This is some, you know, just a, you know, some spiritual worship. Wait. Because he says in verse 2, the Gentiles are going to tread the holy city for 42 months. And the temple has been given over to these Gentiles. 
So if you if we somebody says no no this is not a literal temple this is some spiritual temple but then how will the Gentiles trample it underfoot? So it has to be a literal physical temple. Basically, the picture here is a temple that's being desecrated uh, because remember, for the Jews, Gentiles are not allowed inside the temple. It's only for the Jews. But here, he's saying the temple, the courtyard, everything is being, it's being desecrated. Right? So there has to be a literal temple, but the Gentiles are desecrating. Remember the Antichrist? is a Gentile and he's going to be empowered by armies. We read, read about that in uh, last year, last week in uh, Daniel 8. He's going to get uh, Daniel 8 verse 12. An army was given to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth through the ground. Daniel 8 and verse 12. So this Antichrist, this little horn, he's going to bring all his armies, Gentiles, and they're going to trample underfoot the city, the temple, everything. So it has to be a literal temple that they're going to trample underfoot. And this is go going to go on for 42 months, which is three and a half years. That means the second half of the tribulation, 42 months. And during the same time, 1,260 days, about three and a half years, God's going to have his two prophets. Like just two witnesses. Now we know one of them is Elijah, because uh, Malachi chapter four, God said, "Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the coming of the Lord." So we know. The other one, again, people will discuss. Some may say um, it's Enoch because he also was caught up into heaven like Elijah, and some may, you know, some may say it may be Moses or so on. I personally, my personal thought is it's Enoch and Elijah because both of them did not die but were caught up to heaven. So, but these two witnesses are going to be prophesying and they're going to be doing mighty signs and wonders. They're going to be serving God for the second half of the tri tribulation. So they are in public. They're going to do that. Right? So here again, it makes it very clear there will be a temple where this little horn, given all the armies, is going to come and desecrate it, fulfilling Daniel 8 and verse 12. Right? He's going to do that. And it is going to be for three and a half years. So again, it's telling us correctly, Daniel 9, 27, he said in the middle was Daniel 9, 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Okay, middle of the week. If the week represents seven years, middle of the week is three and a half years, which corresponds very nicely to 42 months. So you see how scripture is backing up scripture. Here it says 42 months, middle of the week, three and a half years, matches perfectly. So that's why we can also work backwards and say that week, Daniel 9.27, one week is seven years. That's just very beautiful. Right? Then we go to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we, we, will, we will study chapter 12 in detail. But what I want to just point us to is this. Uh, verse 13, Daniel 12. Verse 13. Um, somebody could read that, please. You know, Daniel, Revelation 12, 13. Oh, I'm getting mixed up. <laughs> Sorry. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Revelation 12, or somebody could read Revelation 12, verse 12 and 13. So sorry. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Verse 14 also, please. 
but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent mm -hmm. thank you so Revelation 12, uh, I know we're picking up in the middle of that chapter, but the woman represents Israel. The male child is Jesus Christ. Israel gave birth to the Jesus. So now the dragon here represents Satan. He's, he makes his final attempt in Revelation 12. We'll study this in detail. I'm just giving us a little preview there. So he makes his final attempt to get into heaven Michael and the archangels push him out and he's pushed back to the earth knowing that he has a very short time. And so he comes, verse 13, he comes to persecute the woman that Israel who gave birth to the male child, that's Jesus. He comes to persecute. How? Through the Antichrist. Right? So the devil is not coming physically, but he's working through the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so the, the focus of the Antichrist is, 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 is this man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be against persecuting Israel, the saints of the Most High. But verse 14 says that the woman is allowed, she's given this place in the wilderness. And many people think um, there's a big wilderness between Israel and Jordan. So Jordan as a nation rises on the east side of Israel, and that great, there's a great stretch of, of wilderness land, barren lands. And so many people think that, you know, when it says here, yeah, she'll fly to the wilderness, uh, it's probably that people, the Jewish people, many of them will move in that direction to just keep themselves safe. But what I want to point out is this, it says here, for a time and times and half a time. Now remember, we read the same phrase in Daniel. A time, times, and half a time. We read it in Daniel, I think it's verse 7. He says here, um, towards the end, uh, verse 25, um, talking about this Antichrist, Daniel 7.25, he will speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and laws, then the saints will be given to his hand for a time and times and half a time. So Revelation 12, 13 and 14 matches perfectly with Daniel 7, 25. This Antichrist, man of sin, is persecuting the people of Israel, the, those who believe in Jesus, especially those who believe in Jesus, because uh, it says in uh, going back to Revelation 12, that uh, he was persecuting those who keep the commandments of God and that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yeah? Revelation 12, verse 17. So what I really want to point out is a time, times, and half a time. Revelation 12, verse 14, matches. Daniel 7, 25. Now, what is a time, times, and half a time? What is the context already given? 42 months, three and a half years. So a time, times, half a time. One plus two plus half, three and a half. Everything matches, correct? So that's how we can interpret Daniel 7, 25. When we read Daniel 7, 25, a time, times, and half a time, he can say, hey, that's three and a half years. That's 42 months, uh, exactly as given here uh, in the book of Revelation. Okay? So Daniel chapter 7. And then um, Daniel, sorry, Revelation chapter 12. I'm sorry, I'm just getting uh, confused here. And then Revelation chapter 13. Uh, we will come and we will look at it, uh, uh, you know, very, very carefully in detail. But I want to just point out something again here. Revelation chapter 13. Let's please read verses 5 through 7. Revelation 13, 5 through 7, please. 
And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make a war with the saints and overcome them. And mm -hmm. authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Amen. Amen. Perfectly, this matches with what Daniel said. Okay, so uh, I think our line just dropped a little bit. I think the connection is bad. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. So, what I was saying is in Revelation 13, 5 through 7, it matches so perfectly with what Daniel has said. So, this little horn is going to speak blasphemous things against God. But here, Revelation 13, 5, once again says he will be given authority to continue for 42 months. Clearly, once again, 42 months is three and a half years. So that means what Daniel has been saying, you know, this little horn is going to do all these things. It's in this second half of the seven years of tribulation, which he had explained to us in Daniel 9 and 27 that in the middle of the week, he will break it. Once again, here he's telling us it is going to be 42 months, and it is during this time that he is going to make war with the saints. So you connect this back to Daniel 7.25. He said he will make war with the saints for a time, times, and half a time. So what is a time, times, and half a time? It's 42 months, which is three and a half years. Okay? So... Just cross-referencing, uh, and I've just only picked out, you know, uh, the specific parts of the book of Revelation, and saying, hey, now it makes very clear, we can understand what Daniel has been saying. When he says 70 weeks, okay, it has to be, uh, each week represents a year, only then Daniel 9.27 will make sense, only then everything else that is stated in Revelation will make sense. You know, everything adds up very perfectly uh, this way. Right? Uh, any questions on this? Uh, Divya, the assumption of the Antichrist to be a Gentile is because of the reference to him as a little horn or rose from the four horns mentioned in Daniel 7. That's correct, right? So the reason we say this Antichrist is a Gentile is because he comes from one of the four area regions that belong to the Greek Empire. So that's why it's okay, isn't it? And we see that uh, Revelation 11.1 1 says, he was given, uh, the temple was given over to the Gentiles to desecrate it. So that's why we say it's, it's, he's a Gentile. You know, but, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to be hard and fast on it. I'm just making an inference based on uh, uh, Daniel 8, where uh, Daniel has uh, told us that after the goat, the main horn breaks four territories. And from one of them comes the little horn. So that's why I'm saying, that's why we're saying that the Antichrist is, would be a Gentile. Yeah, you're right. So question, will a Gentile be accepted by the Jewish people? 
So the thing about the Antichrist is, or this man of sin is, he comes as a man of peace. And his influence, remember, how he's going to come to power. There are 10 leaders from the, who belonged to the former Roman Empire, 10 leaders. This little horn will arise and he'll, he will greatly influence three of these 10 leaders. And it is basically these 10 leaders who will prop him up into power. Okay? And we, read, we will read about this when we go into Revelation, in Revelation chapter 18, what actually is going to happen. These 10 leaders are going to prop up the Antichrist, um, uh, bringing him to power. He gains access by really influencing three of them. They put him in power. And he introduces the false prophet, which is the world religious system. But and we will see in Revelation 18 that towards the end, these 10 leaders will withdraw support. So basically, the, the beast and the false prophet are left on their own. And the, there is a complete collapse of the religious system, Revelation chapter 17, sorry. Uh, we read, this, read about this in Revelation 17. First, there is a collapse of the religious system, Revelation 17. Revelation 18, there's a collapse of the economic system. So the 10 leaders are the ones who are propping up the beast, the Antichrist who is then also supported by the false prophet. Revelation 17, the 10 leaders are withdrawing their support and both these things collapse. There's a collapse of the um, religion brought in by the false prophet. Revelation 18, there's a collapse of the economic system. So um, this, this antichrist is really a man who has influence on both sides. Somehow he's able to influence the people to come into establish a covenant of peace. So today, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, uh, for whatever reason, Israel has been greatly supported by, usually it's the President of the United States, the UK, and sometimes Germany and France will be supporting, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel. People have changed, but generally that's been the positioning. Uh, and so they're all Gentiles. And um, trying, you know, supporting Israel, um, and that's what that's been the trend. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, Jeffina, your question, please. Yeah. Uh, can you just explain a little more on the uh, 70th week of Daniel? If I'm right. I, uh, so what the term actually means, I think I lost you know, somewhere. I understand that the week signifies is seven years and all that, but what's the 70th week actually signifies? So I don't it Sure, sure. So this is back beginning in uh, Daniel 9. Uh, verse 24, so Gabriel tells Daniel, I've come to talk to you about 70 weeks. Hmm? So, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you about 70 weeks, about your people and your city. Now, 69 weeks have been fulfilled. Because 69 weeks was a time from the issue of King Cyrus till the Messiah being cut off. 483. 69 weeks has been finished. So the 70th week is left. That one week is that 70th week. So that's why they, we, we refer to that last week as 70th week. Because 69 weeks have been done. It's already fulfilled. 70th week is left. That 70th week is the seven years of tribulation. That's all. All right, let's pause here for today. Um, you know, please take some time to, you know, maybe uh, listen to all of this one more time or read read it up again. Just think about it. If you have any questions, we'll pick it up next week. 
Uh, but the plan for next week is um, uh, we should be finishing the book of Daniel. We'll go through chapter 11 and 12. Again, these are amazing, amazing things uh, in both these chapters. Uh, let's see. Let's try to finish it uh, next week. Okay. God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, we'll break now so we can get ready for the next class. Okay? Thank you. God bless.